let's do this. If you're there and you can hear me, say something in the chat. Yeah, we're not doing that. Perfect. All right. As long as somebody can, I'm. Uh, as you guys can see, I've figured out how to do some screen casting options here. Uh, I'm not exactly sure what it looks like to you guys, but hopefully you can see the textbook and you can see the uh, chat on the left side there. And then I might show up in a tiny part of this whole thing somewhere. All right. Let's do this. All right, uh, so we're picking up where we left off tonight. It's a short reading focusing on the alternatives to absolutism. Uh, what this means is not every place went absolutist. That's what, what we talked about the other day. Some places had people who fought back, uh, like Russia, and that did not work, and absolutists won. But in other places, you're going to see them try to do this, and then they're not going to work out. So England is definitely the more important of the two here. Uh, between England and the Netherlands. So uh, we'll focus on them, but it's only about seven or eight pages. So uh, let's just get to it. All right, so starting on page 489, uh, we're underneath the heading Alternatives to Absolutism in England and the Dutch Republic. How and why did the constitutional state triumph in the Dutch Republic and England? All right, so let's do this. Well, France... Prussia, Russia, and Austria developed absolutist states. England and the Netherlands evolved toward constitutionalism, which is the limitation of government by law. Complete different direction than absolutism. Constitutionalism also implies a balance between the authority and power of the government on the one hand and the rights and liberties of the subjects on the other. By definition, all constitutionalist governments have a constitution, be it written or unwritten. A nation's constitution may be embodied in one basic document and occasionally revised by amendment like the Constitution of the United States. Or it may be only partly formalized and include parliamentary statutes, judicial decisions, and a body of traditional excuse me, procedures and practices like the English and Dutch constitutions. Can you, there we go. Despite their common commitment to constitutional, we're on page 490 now, Government, England and Dutch Republic represented significantly different alternatives to absolute rule. After decades of civil war and an experiment with republicanism, the English opted for a constitutional monarchy in 1688. This settlement, which has endured to this day, retained a monarch as the titular head of the government, but vested sovereignty in an elected parliament. Let's stop right there. That sentence again is saying that the constitutional monarchy that they made back in 1688, is still what's happening today. What has changed, obviously, is that the king and the queen, that power is obviously mostly um, just for show nowadays. All power is essentially in parliament today. Upon gaining independence from Spain in 1648, the Dutch rejected monarchical rule, adopting a republican form of government in which elected estates held supreme power. Neither was democratic by any standard. But to other Europeans, they were shining examples of the restraint of arbitrary power and rule of law. So let's dive into England here. Absolutist claims in England. In 1588, Queen Elizabeth I of England exercised very great personal power. By 1689, the English monarchy was severely circumscribed. That means they lost a lot of power. 
A rare female monarch, Elizabeth was able to maintain control over her realm in part by refusing to marry and submit to a husband. She was immensely popular with her people, but left no immediate heir to continue her legacy. In 1603, Elizabeth's Scottish cousin, James Stuart, succeeded her as James I. Oh. Sorry, guys. Um, real quick, that James the First guy is the same guy from Jamestown, from the James River. Um, any place around here called James, that's the guy. That's the king that's named after that. Uh, James is going to rule, as you guys can see, from 1603 to 1625. And in 1607, he's the guy who establishes, or at least permits, the Virginia Company to exist. And then they send out people who eventually establish Jamestown. They name it after him. So starting in the second sentence of the second paragraph of Absolutist Claims in England. King James was well educated and had 35 years experience as King of Scotland, but he was not interested in displaying the majesty of monarchy as Elizabeth had been. Urged to wave at crowds who waited to greet their new ruler, James complained that he was tired and threatened to drop his preaches, breeches so they can cheer at my arse. So he clearly was not stoked about people. He said they could cheer at his buttocks, which is interesting. James's greatest problem, however, stemmed from his absolutist belief that a monarch has a divine right to his authority and responsible unto God. This is huge, guys. This divine right here. That is a big term. It's just the idea that a ruler has all their power given to them, and they're only responsible to God. James went so far as to lecture the House of Commons, quote, There are no privileges and immunity which can stand against a divinely appointed king. Such a view ran directly counter to English traditions that a person's property could not be taken away without due process of law. James I and his son Charles I considered such constraints intolerable and a threat to their divine right prerogative. Consequently, bitter squabbles erupted between the Crown and the House of Commons. The expenses of England's intervention in the Thirty Years' War, through hostilities with Spain and France, only exacerbated or made worse tensions. Charles I's response was to refuse to summon Parliament from 1629 onward. That's not good. Charles is not going to end well. Relations between the king and the House of Commons were also embittered by religious issues. In the early 17th century, growing numbers of English people felt dissatisfied with the Church of England established by Henry VIII. Many Puritans believed that the Protestant Reformation of the 16th century had not oh, excuse me, gone far enough. They wanted to purify the Anglican Church of lingering Roman Catholic elements, they wanted to get rid of, for example, elaborate vestments, uh, clothing, robes, things like that, and ceremonials, bishops, and even the giving and wearing of wedding rings. They thought that was over the top. Interesting. James responded to such ideas by declaring, quote, no bishop, no king. So he pretty much said, if you get rid of bishops, you get rid of the king, and you can't get rid of the king, so the bishops are going to stay. For James, bishops were among the chief supporters of the throne. His son and successor, Charles I, First, further antagonized religious sentiments. That means he made this worse. Not only did Charles I marry a Catholic princess, but he also supported the heavy-handed policies of the Archbishop of Canterbury, William Loud. In 1637, Loud attempted to impose two new elements on church organization in Scotland. A new prayer book modeled on the Anglican Book of Common Prayer, uh, that was written by, I believe, Thomas Cranmer, we learned about, and Bishop Pricks. The shop bricks. I have no idea what that is. Has anyone ever heard of that in their life? The shop bricks. Ooh, look up Wikipedia. That's nice. It's another word for a diocese. Oh, it's just a district, kind of like a, a state. So he said pretty much the bishops were in charge of this group, this organization of land. All right. No, do not create a flashcard. Uh, starting, here we go. The Presbyterian Scots rejected. Remember the Presbyterians? John Knox went over to Scotland, brought Calvinism with him. They became Presbyterians. They're obviously pissed because they don't want to become Anglican, which to them is too much like Catholicism. The Presbyterian Scots rejected these elements and revolted. To finance an army to put down the Scots, King Charles was compelled to call a meeting of Parliament in November of 1640. He had ruled for 11 years, 1629-1640, without Parliament, financing his government through extraordinary stopgap levies or taxes considered illegal by most English people. For example, the king revived a medieval law 
requiring coastal districts to help pay the cost of ships for defense, but he levied the tax called ship money on inland as well as coastal countries. Most members of parliament were not willing to trust such a despotic king with an army. Moreover, many supported the Scots' resistances to Charles's religious innovations. Accordingly, this parliament, called the Long Parliament because it sat for 20 years, 1640 to 1660, enacted legislation that limited the power of the monarch and made government without parliament impossible. In 1641, the Commons passed the Triennial Act, which compelled the king to summon parliament every three years. The Commons impeached Archbishop Loud and then threatened to abolish bishops. King Charles, fearful of a Scottish invasion, the original reason for summer, summer summoning Parliament, reluctantly accepted these measures. The next act in the conflict was precipitated by the outbreak of rebellion in Ireland, where English governors and landlords had long exploited the people. In 1641, the Catholic gentry of Ireland led an uprising in... Response to a feared invasion by anti-Catholic forces of the British Long Parliament. All right, sorry about that. Without an army, Charles could neither come to terms with the Scots nor respond to an Irish rebellion. After a failed attempt to arrest parliamentary leaders, Charles left London for the north of England. There he recruited an army drawn from the nobility and its cavalry staff, the rural gentry and mercenaries. In response, Parliament formed its own army, the New Model Army, composed of militia of the City of London and country squires. What are you doing? With business connections. During the spring of 1642, both sides prepared for war. In July, a linen weaver became the first casualty of a civil war during a skirmish between royal and parliamentary forces. So we got one side, the royal side, that supports the king, and the other side, the parliamentary side, that supports, of course, Parliament. Excuse me. You have this map right here about the English Civil War. Then you guys can see how centered around London was the parliamentarians, and then the royalists got the orange there. So here we go. The English Civil War, 1642 to 1649, pitted the power of the king against Parliament. After three years of fighting, Parliament's new model army defeated the king's armies at the battles of Naseby and Longport in the summer of 1645. Charles, though, refused to concede defeat. Both sides jockeyed for position, waiting for a decisive event. This arrived in the form of the army under the leadership of Oliver Cromwell, a member of the House of Commons and a devout Puritan. Remember, kids, Puritans are people who do not like the Anglican Church. They think that the Anglican Church is still too similar to Catholicism. They want to purify it, hence the name Puritans. These are, are the same Puritans, or beliefs, that these guys held that are going to end up in North America at New England. That's like Plymouth Rock and the Mayflower and the Puritans end up over there and they institute their own religious theocracy. Um, it doesn't go well if you don't believe what they believe. They are not tolerant whatsoever of religion um, that isn't their own. In 1647, Cromwell's forces captured the king and dismissed anti-Cromwell members of parliament. That's not good, so they're trading one king for another guy who kicks out anybody who doesn't agree with him. In 1649, the remaining representatives, known as the Rump Parliament, put Charles on trial for high treason. Charles was found guilty and beheaded on January 30th, 1649, an act that sent shockwaves around Europe. So what's going to happen now? Cromwell and Puritanical Absolutism in England. So, this is going to talk about how England became an absolutist state under the leadership of Cromwell, but eventually they do fall on the side of constitutionalism, but they're still working out the kinks. Let's keep going here. With the execution of Charles, kingship was abolished. The question remained of how the country would be governed. One answer was provided by philosopher Thomas Hobbes. Super important person, guys. Thomas Hobbes here, guys. Super important. He's going to come up now. He's going to come up later. Uh, Thomas Hobbes is a big part of the United States uh, ideas of government. He writes a book called Leviathan, which we'll get to down here, okay? Just you need to know Thomas Hobbes. You gotta know him. Hobbes held a pessimistic view of human nature and believed that, left to themselves, humans would complete, compete violently for power and wealth. The only solution, as he outlined in his 1651 treatise, Leviathan, was a social contract in which all members of society placed themselves under the authority of the absolute rule of a sovereign who would maintain peace and order. So the idea he argues is that humans are terrible, and we need somebody strong in charge to make sure we don't kill each other. 
And so how much power should that person have? Absolute power. So Thomas Hobbes supported the idea of absolutism. So picking back up. Hobbes imagined society as a human body in which the monarch served as the head and the individual subjects together made up the body. Just as the body cannot sever his own head, so Hobbes believed that society could not have it except for the contract rise up against its king. That's obviously not going to work. Hobbes' longing for a benevolent absolute monarch was not widely shared in England. Instead, Oliver Cromwell and his supporters enshrined a commonwealth or republican government known as the Protectorate. Theoretically, that's a key word meaning... Theoretically is a keyword meaning this is not actually going to happen, but this is what they thought would. Theoretically, legislative power rested in the surviving members of parliament and executive power was lodged in a council of state. In fact, the army controlled the government and Oliver Cromwell controlled the army, ruling what was essentially a military dictatorship. There you go. The army prepared a constitution, the instrument of government in 1653, that invested executive power in Lord Protector, who was Cromwell, and a council of state. It provided for triennial every three years, parliaments, and gave parliament the sole power to raise taxes. But after repeated disputes, Cromwell dismissed parliament in 1655, and the instrument was never formally endorsed. So, they get rid of a king because he never talks to parliament, and when he does, he only wants money from them, and eventually they get mad, have a civil war, and kill him. Cromwell says, hey, I'll be different, and then ends up doing the exact same thing. He also dismisses Parliament and tries to rule like a despotic dictator, except this one is religiously despotic. He controlled the army. So it says Cromwell continued the standing army and proclaimed quasi-martial law. He divided England into 12 military districts, each governed by a military general. Reflecting Puritan ideals of morality, Cromwell's state forbade sports, closed theaters, and rigorously censored the press. So they traded a king for a guy who was a military and religious tyrant. Yikes. Let's get more specific. On the issue of religion, Cromwell favored some degree of toleration, and the instrument of government gave all Christians, except Roman Catholics, the right to practice their faith. That's not bad. Cromwell had long associated Catholicism in Ireland with sedition, which means to break away or to fight against your government, and heresy, which is a word for a teaching that is not accepted by a church. He led an army there to Ireland to crush, to reconquer the country in August of 1649. One month later, his forces crushed a rebellion at Drogheda and massacred the garrison. After Cromwell's departure for England, atrocities worsened. The English banned Catholicism in Ireland executed priests, confiscated land from Catholics for English and Scottish settlers. These brutal acts left a legacy of Irish hatred for England. I'll be straight up, that continues to this day. Cromwell adopted mercantilist policies similar to those of absolutist France. And again, if you guys look up mercantilist here, how does it not have the definition? Anyway, mercantilist is just the idea that they need lots of money. Your government runs best, as you can see here. They're designed to maximize exports, minimize imports, and get lots of cash. He enforced a Navigation Act requiring that English goods have to be transported on English ships. The act was a great boost to the development of an English merchant marine. It's kind of like the Navy, but instead of warfare, they're all about shipping things. We still have merchant marine today. And brought about a short but successful war with the commercially threatened Dutch. While mercantilist legislation ultimately benefited English commerce, for ordinary people, the turmoil of foreign war only added to the harsh conditions of life by years of civil war. Cromwell also welcomed the immigration of Jews because of their skills in business, and they began to return to England after four centuries of absence. So it's interesting. As much as he's a despotic leader religiously, he does tolerate people of Catholic faith, but he also apparently thought Jews were A-OK -okay because they were helping him out. Uh, all right. The protectorate collapsed when Cromwell died in 1658. His ineffectual son succeeded him. Fed up with military rule, the English longed for a return of civilian government, and with it, common law and social stability. By 1616, they were ready to restore the monarchy. So it's like you break up with somebody because you think it's bad, and then you get back together with, like, get together with somebody else, and it's like way worse, and you realize, wow, that last one wasn't that bad. The reality is they were both bad. You're just, uh, I need to really, really get out more and find somebody who, like, treats you well. So you know what, what good is, instead of comparing everything to a terrible person. Then you're always going to be screwed in a cycle of abusive and emotional relationships. Don't do that. Find somebody good, like I'd have. The restoration of the English monarchy. Let's bring it back. The restoration of 1660 brought to the throne Charles II, eldest son of Charles I, 
Keep in mind, Charles I was beheaded for treason. The son ran away to France because so, he wouldn't, didn't want to die, so they brought him back. They're actually going to call this guy the Merry Monarch, M-E-R-R-Y. Is it happy? Because he was like, hey, yeah, you guys can have theaters again. Everyone's like, we can have theaters again? Yes! We can have dancing again? All right! So everyone loved this guy. He wasn't a very good king, but he was like, better than the last guy. Both houses of parliament were restored together with the established Anglican Church. The restoration failed to resolve two serious problems, however. What was to be the attitude to, of the state toward Puritans, Catholics, and dissenters, and what was to be the relationship between the king and parliament? To answer to the first question, parliament enacted the Test Act against those outside the Church of England. It denied them the right to vote, hold public office, preach, teach, attend universities, or even assemble for meetings. But these restrictions could not be enforced. When the Quaker, William Penn, held a meeting of his friends and was arrested, the jury refused to convict him. So they had these laws, but they couldn't actually enforce them. William Penn, I believe, is Pennsylvania. That guy. I think. Let's see. William Penn. Look at that. My man goes and produces Pennsylvania. Go Eagles. In politics, Charles II's initial determination to work with Parliament did not last long. Finding that Parliament did not grant him an adequate income, he wants more money, in 1607 Charles entered into a secret agreement with his cousin, Louis XIV. The French king would give Charles 200,000 pounds annually. Uh, let's see. I'm trying to see uh, how much that would be worth today. Source year, 1670, target year. Convert. That's $47 million in today's money a year. Good God. Uh, in return for all this, Charles would relax laws against Catholics, gradually re-Catholicize England, and even convert to Catholicism himself for the low price of $47 million a year. My man sold himself to make Cat uh, England Catholic again. Mecca, apparently. However, when details of the treaty leaked out, a great wave of anti-Catholic sentiment swept England. When Charles died and his Catholic brother James became king... The worst English anti-Catholic fears were realized. In violation of the Test Act, James II appointed, so it went Charles I, no, it went James, then Charles, then Charles, then James. Good Lord, this is complicated. In violation of the Test Act, James appointed Roman Catholics to positions in the armies, universities, and the local government. When these actions were challenged in the court, the judges who James had appointed decided in favor of the king. See, that's garbage. Because the law said that those people weren't allowed to be there, and the judges just said, hey, we don't care what the law is. James and his supporters opened new Catholic churches and schools and issued tracts promoting Catholicism, attempting to broaden his base of support with Protestant dissenters and nonconformists. He said, religious freedom to everybody. However, James's opponents, a powerful coalition of eminent persons in Parliament and Church of England, bitterly resisted James's ambitions. They offered the English throne to James's heir, his Protestant daughter Mary, and her Dutch husband, Prince William of Orange. So they're literally just going to take away the throne from James II and just give it to his daughter, who is a Protestant, and her Dutch husband, William of Orange. In December of 1688, James II and his queen and their infant son fled to France and became pensioners of Louis XIV. Early in 1689, William and Mary crowned queen, King and Queen of England. William and Mary? Yes, kids. That William and Mary. The same ones who are connected to the school right up the road. So William and Mary of Orange, the school William and Mary. Let's see when it was founded. 1693 by King William III and Queen Mary II. So they actually got into power in 1689. Four years later, they commissioned the College of William and Mary. It's one of the oldest universities in the country. Apparently second oldest, only after Harvard. But to be fair, Harvard started out as a very small school, I believe. Like super tiny. Yeah, it was just Harvard College. Yeah, anyway, Harvard gets, the, Harvard gets the nod. All right, let's finish up. Constitutional Monarchy and the Cabinet Government. The English called the events of 1688 and 1689 the Glorious Revolution because they believed it replaced one king with another with barely any bloodshed. 
That's what I heard growing up. In truth, William's arrival sparked revolutionary riots and violence across the British Isles and in North American cities such as Boston and New York's. Uprisings by supporters of James, known as Jacobites, occurred in 1689 in Scotland. In Ireland, the two sides waged outright war from 1689 to 1691. William's victory at the Battle of the Boyne and the subsequent Treaty of Limerick sealed his accession to power. There's also a later on battle, Battle of Culloden. This is a very famous battle in Scottish history where Jacobite forces of Charles Edward Stuart were defeated by William Augustus and the Scots never again were able to support them. They lost power and they became essentially a vassal state of England. In England, the revolution represented the final destruction of the idea of divine right monarchy. The men who brought about the revolution framed their intentions in the Bill of Rights, which was formulated in direct response to Stuart absolutism. Law was to be made in Parliament. Once made, it could not be suspended by the Crown. Parliament had to be called at least once every three years. The independence of the judiciary was established, and there was no standing army in peacetime. Protestants could not possess arms, but the Catholic minority could not. Excuse me. Protestants could possess arms, but Catholic minority could not. No Catholic could ever inherit the throne. Additional legislation granted freedom of worship to Protestant dissenters, but not to Catholics. William and Mary accepted these principles when they took the throne, and the House of Parliament passed the Bill of Rights in December 1689. The Glorious Revolution, the concept of representative governments, found its best defense in the political philosopher John Locke. John Locke, just like Thomas Hobbes' kids, super important, you have to know this guy. Big, big, big deal. He is the guy who phrases are inside of our own Declaration of Independence Constitution. All right? So he wrote something called the Second Treatise of Civil Government. Locke maintained that a government that oversteps its proper function, which is to do what? Protect the natural rights of life, liberty, and property. Thomas Jefferson is going to change that word about 76 years later into uh, pursuit of happiness. Becomes a tyranny. That's a great question, man. I don't know, dude. You don't. Guess we're doing it early. Man, this daylight savings time has got me all whacked up. But we're one page away. Let's finish it up, huh? By natural rights, Locke meant rights basic to all men because all have the ability to reason. Under a tyrannical government, the people have a natural right to rebellion. On the basis of this link, he justified limiting the vote to property owners. Uh, Locke's idea that there are natural and universal rights equally valid for all people's societies became especially... Um... I would say no. I mean, you hear the idea that, to Nico's question he asked, would firearms be considered an invention on the same level as the printing press? Uh, I mean, yes and no. Um, I, w I don't know. That's a, that's, a, that's a hard question. I would say no. Because, again, you've heard pen is mightier than the sword. And uh, the idea that you can spread ideas through the printing press um, is pretty powerful. You know, you can kill a whole bunch of people, but if the ideas of what they had persist, then that is always going to continue, you know? Um, but yeah, obviously firearms are a big deal. But uh, by this point in history, a lot of people have firearms, so it's not necessarily about who has guns so much as it's about who has uh, more guns. All right, uh, American colonists also appreciated his arguments that Native Americans had no property rights since they did not cultivate the land, and by extension, no political rights because they possessed no property. Yikes. The events of 1688 and 1689 did not constitute a democratic revolution. The revolution placed sovereignty in Parliament, and Parliament only represented the upper classes. The age of the aristocratic government lasted at least until 1832, and in many ways until 1928 when women received full voting rights. In the course of the 18th century, the cabinet system of government evolved. The term cabinet derives from a small private room in which English rulers consulted their chief ministers. In a cabinet system... The leading ministers who must have seats in and the support of a majority of the House of Commons formulate common policy and conduct the business of the country. During the administration of one royal minister, Sir Robert Walpole, who led the cabinet from 1721 to 1742, the idea developed that the cabinet was responsible to the House of Commons. The, the, Hanover, the Hanoverian king, George I, 
normally presided at cabinet meetings throughout his reign, but his son and heir, George II, discontinued the practice. The influence of the crown in decision-making accordingly declined. Walpole enjoyed the favor of the monarchy and to the House of Commons and came to be called the king's first or prime minister. We have that today. In the English cabinet system, both legislative power and executive power are held by the leading ministers who form the government. England's brief and chaotic experiment with republicanism under Oliver Cromwell convinced its people of the advantages of a monarchy, albeit with strong checks on royal authority. For supporters of Parliament, the tolerant and moderate Dutch Republic had provided a powerful counterexample to Louis XIV's absolutism. And I think that's where we are going to stop for today. Yeah, we stop at Dutch, so what are we supposed to do? Explain constitutionalism. Constitutionalism, if you guys go back, you got the, dex the definition... Uh, one, two. Definition of constitutionalism should be right here. And you get a whole breakaway here, right? Constitutionalism, form of government, power limited by law. Uh, divine right of kings is simple. Uh, these people believe they were quite literally above the law. They only answer to God himself. Uh, that's going to be found right here. James said there are no privileges, right? He believed he was only responsible to God. He's not the only one to believe that. Break down the English Civil War, timeline events. Yikes, it's a lot, kids. Uh, I would definitely go through and just highlight the events or find a timeline of one. Uh, maybe I'll post one. And why? what was the glorious revolution? Why was it glorious? Uh, well, that's easy because they didn't like the king and they just asked somebody else to take over and they did. And the violence was lower than they expected. So they said it was the glorious revolution. Um, again, that can be found on page 494. Uh, lots written about that. But that's how we get William and Mary, kids, um, which is interesting. Yeah, to your point, though, yeah, obviously I have my days a bit mixed up, you guys. Um, tomorrow is a B day, so this is not – you don't need to read this until the 6th. And then the next reading would be the 8th. So I'm going to update that in Schoology now just to make sure we're all on the same page. Obviously um, – Anybody who's watching this later, you now know why what's going on is going on. Um, so I don't see you guys again until the 6th. And then that would be the 8th. And then we'll get to the Dutch Republic. We probably could double up on that, but we'll just stop right there. All right. Uh, hopefully that worked out okay. Uh, any last-minute questions to anything? Hopefully it's all good. Everybody's good with the book. English Civil War. Uh, let's look up timeline. Uh, let's see here. Uh, here's a pretty good timeline. This one's really in depth. Like, way too in depth, actually. <laughs> uh, a little bit much. Let's see if we got some more condensed ones here. This one's not too bad, actually, a little bit shorter. All right, I'm going to call it a night, you guys. Uh, if you're watching this late, uh, as in not live, then that's cool, too. And uh, I'll check you guys on Wednesday.